Welcome everyone. We're going to get started and those that come in can catch up with us. So hi, I'm Justine Martin and I'm from Resilience Mindset and with me today is my friend and colleague Alison Brown from Everfield. Ever heal. I've already had an MS brain fart and we've just started off. It's okay. It's World MS Day. We're allowed to have, you know, MS brain farts. We're allowed to make a few mistakes. It's all good. We all understand, right, guys? Thumbs up or uh, agree in the chat if um, you've ever had an MS brain fart as well. Um, so we're so excited that we're here for the Empowering Lives with MS workshop today. We're going to share five tips to a healthy body and mind. So where are you joining from in the world? Let us know in the chat. Just type in um, where you're from. We're from Geelong, which is near Melbourne in Australia. So I know for a few of you guys, I've already sort of seen a couple of you already. Uh, I know that you guys are from the other side of the world. So it's not actually technically your World MS Day. That's like will be tomorrow for you. Um, but it is for us today here in Australia. So wow. let us know in the chat. We've got Los Angeles joining us. Yay, welcome, welcome, welcome. So cool, I love it. And I love the fact that we get to be able to share this World MS Day with people from all around the world. Like how amazing is that, Justine? Ah, it's just phenomenal. You know, you've got to love modern technology. I know, right? Um, So look, we're really excited to be able to share with you our top five tips for, you know, living well with MS um, as well as possible. Obviously, it's a a debilitating illness that can impact us in lots of different ways, Um, but we want to give you our top five tips for living your best life with MS. And I'm really excited to actually share that we've got a bunch of giveaways during our session today. So we've got some freebies and handouts and stuff. And at the end, um, if you stick around to the end, both Justine and I have two amazing giveaways for you guys for sticking around. Um, plus, I think, Justine, you've also got a free ebook for people that signed up to I today's have. session. I have. I most definitely have. Um, and you will be all getting that uh, via email at the end. We'll be sending out a recording um, of today's session. So if you want to re-watch it and get any more of the tips and hints that we'll be uh, sharing with you, um, you will all receive a copy uh, this evening once I've done the editing process of it all um, with all the offers that we're putting through today as well. Perfect. That's so, awesome. Alison, let's just start with the basics, shall we? Can you tell people what MS is and how it impacts our body? Yeah, sure. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, can you guys see that okay? I've just got a little PowerPoint there. Got some nods in the chat. Thank you. Okay, okay. So as you would probably know, um, MS is an autoimmune condition and it affects our central nervous system. So that's our brain and our spinal cord. Um, and it's effectively where our immune system just starts attacking our own cells. And obviously this can uh, give us a bunch of different symptoms, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. But it affects three times as many women as it does men. Um, so I can imagine that most of the people that we've probably got on the session today, I can see a number of women on the chat here uh, on the uh, screen. So look, it affects more of us um, than it does men. And usually we're between 20 and 40 when we get diagnosed. It's not a hard and fast rule because we do we do know people, um, Justine, that have been diagnosed at like 13, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, in the last couple of weeks, because we're working on a project, which we will tell you uh, a little bit later on, uh, there's two that have been diagnosed at 13 years of age. So uh, it's more common now um, the younger uh, ones are being diagnosed. Yeah, it is. And it's quite tragic. I mean, uh, we'll talk about our stories a little bit later as well. Um, But it is, it's quite debilitating, um, particularly for a young person. But, you know, I do know people that are in their 50s or 60s when they got diagnosed as well. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but it does, um, it does knock people down in their prime quite a lot. Well, Michelle's just commented that she was diagnosed at 63. Oh, wow. Yeah, Yeah. wow. And it is, as I say, like, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's, it's, MS doesn't discriminate, right? Um, it can affect us um, at any stage of life, which is, you know, it's it's quite tragic, but, um, you know, we do our best to get by um, and make the most of, you know, the life that we have. 
Um, so look, I, I'm not sure whether you know much about me, but I did a lot of research into um, diet and its impact to um, uh, MS. Uh, but when I was actually doing my research, I discovered that it's not all about genetics. We don't just get MS just through genetics. So our risk of getting MS is actually only 25% genetics, right? So that's the DNA that we get from our parents when we're born. Um, 75% of the risk is actually our environment, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, because these are factors that we can actually change. So this concept is known as epigenetics. Now, I'm not going to go into all the detail of it, but I just want you to understand that there are some factors in this environmental space that we can control. And if we can control them in a very uncontrollable sort of situation with MS, this gives us a bit of power back, right? Which is exactly what we want. So when I'm talking about genetic, uh, sorry, environmental factors, this can be a lot of different things, right? It can be our physical environment, like where we live in the world. Um, what I didn't mention, I should just go back a second. Uh, what I didn't mention was this map on the right-hand side here. Um, it affects 2.8 million people, MS, uh, worldwide. And if you look at the map, this is actually showing the prevalence of MS across the different areas of the world. So where we are in Australia, we're in a kind of moderate um, place to actually get MS. And the reason is because it's uh, further from the equator, right? So this is an environmental factor because this is a physical location thing. Um, and you guys in the States, like you guys are in the red zone. So you guys are very prevalent um, to getting it because you're further away from the equator as well. So this can be um, a big sort of factor. But other environmental factors can include things like um, medication, whether or not you smoke, um, your sort of... Uh, community sort of interactions, the level of stress that you might have. And the big one that um, I discovered and I did a lot of research into was how diet impacts our genetics as well. Uh, so let me just stop sharing there. Um, so it can actually be that we get a lot of different symptoms. Um, so we'll actually go back to sharing, sorry. We get a lot of different symptoms and let me know in the chat which ones of these you've actually experienced before. So numbing and tingling is one that's 63% of us get numbing and tingling. <laughs> so I've definitely had one of those, uh, that before. What about you, Justine? Uh, yes, I'm sitting here at the moment tingling actually, Alison. <laughs> that's right. Let us know in the chat if you're like, yep, that's, that's a big one for me. Um, obviously, we've got some, things like visual problems, um, optic neuritis, for example. Um, that's 40% of us get that. Um, I'm getting that people. one too. As yep. you know, the last three weeks I've been uh, like someone smeared Vaseline over my eyes. Yep, that's right. Walking difficulties, muscle spasms, fatigue, that impacts a lot of us, right? Um, cognitive dysfunction, like, look. This is not an exhausting list either. <laughs> um, but look, let us know in the chat if you experience, you know, some of these feelings. Uh, which one's the, the most prevalent for you? Or What's... maybe you don't have MS but you know someone that does and they've expressed to you um, some of these symptoms and maybe you're <laughs> aware on, you know, how many different symptoms that there actually are. So... Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, it affects us in a lot of different ways. You can just look at this and think, Actually, that's like all over our body, right? So every one of these has a, a different impact, but it can affect our entire bodies, um, which is, you know, it's frustrating, right? <laughs> and um, I, will, I will explain as well, Alison, in there that um, for those that don't have MS, how come that person has that symptom and that person has that symptom that maybe, you know, they don't have the same symptoms? It all depends on where the MS attacks in the central nervous system, putting scarring on the myelin sheath. So the central nervous system is quite large through all of us and where the cognitive damage is, where the myelin um, sheath has been damaged will then um, determine what symptoms each of us have. So that's how we're all linked by a common thread of having MS, but our symptoms can be quite varied. Absolutely, Justine. And what, what sort of symptoms have you faced in the past? Like what's been your worst symptoms? Uh, my vision. 
Um, so like what I said, it's like someone has smeared Vaseline across my glasses, but it's actually my eyes. And that's what first led me to being diagnosed. And uh, it's recently cropped up its uh, reary head uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, mobility issues. Um, sometimes I can't feel a leg and I will fall over as what has recently happened as well. Uh, fatigue is a big one for me. Um, managing my fatigue, I think um, if it's under control, then my quality of life is far better uh, the next day. So, um, Absolutely. And I see a lot of nods, you know, from other people that are on this. They're, they're saying like, yeah, me too, me too. So it's so, so common that we get um, struck down with these symptoms. Um, so Justine, can you just tell us a little bit about like your story? What What led you to, you know, this place of, MS and fatigue and all these kind of symptoms. Um, sure, sure, Ken. And if you've got any questions for me, just pop them in the chat um, as well. Oh, there are always scary photos, Alison, that you've popped up there. So my journey with MS started when I was actually nine years of age when my mum was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis back in about 1981, it was. Uh, we were always told that we would never get MS. I've got a younger brother. Um, that it wasn't hereditary, don't worry about it. So I didn't. I lived a very uh, carefree life, ate way too much food, as you can see on the left-hand side, became morbidly obese-free for all of my 20s um, and then finally took control of that um, in my early 30s and got to goal weight in about oh, 2007. But that had caused a lot of damage on my system Um in all those years that I abused my body. And so I lost 46 kilos. Life was good. Um, I just met the man of my dreams, got recently engaged, um, was in my dream job. I was a program director for Jenny Craig and then my vision started going funny. Went to the doctors uh, for uh, something else and just mentioned that my vision was blurry. Now, a couple of years earlier than that, I had facial pain and a lump behind my ear and he sent me off for an MRI and they discovered a cyst in my brain and which is quite common uh, a lot of us are actually born with these cysts and they're not stumbled across until they're looking for something else so he um suggested that I go and see because I've never had that investigated and here I was talking about vision problems and he suggested that I go and see a neurosurgeon. So within 24 hours, they'd rush me into a neurosurgeon and I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to, you know, operate my brain, in my, give me brain surgery. And the first question I actually asked him was, do you think this is MS? And he's like, oh, no, no. I said, well, my mum, you know, had an MS. She passed away from complications at the age of 49 from the disease. My mum's cousin has MS and my nana's, my nana's cousin's great granddaughter has it as well. So we have a strong genetic link through my family. And he told me, no, he didn't think it was. He thought um, it was something else, sent me to the opt ophthalmologist. My vision works fine, uh, 2020 when it's working fine. But um, yeah, it's probably about five out of 20 when, when it's not. Um, had another MRI and I lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, so I had white spots, which is what MRIs uh, do um, in showing the brain damage. And went back to him. He said he couldn't help me anymore, sent me off to a neurologist. A week later, I was sitting at the neurologist's office. Again, I, the first question I asked him was, do you think that this is MS? And the answer was no. I think it's your migraines. I've been a hemiplegic migraine sufferer since I was 15. Uh, put me on migraine medication and I continued to get worse. And, and then about four months later, I was finally diagnosed. Two weeks after I turned 40, um, uh, two weeks after I turned 40, I was diagnosed with MS. Um, I know this might sound strange to you all, but I'm actually the healthiest and the happiest I've been in my whole entire life. Um, even though I live with um, all the symptoms uh, with MS on a daily uh, battle. Now, in the last 11 years, um, 
12 years in 2013, 14, 15, I underwent heart surgeries. 2016, I was diagnosed with a blood condition called Lividio reticularis. So I started going purple. I looked like a zombie and the kids thought it was great um, that mum was the walking dead. Uh, then I was diagnosed with melanoma on my leg when they were looking for lymphoma. So there's three things that can cause lividio reticularis, and that is lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or lymphoma. So the rheumatologist roomed, ruled out all of that and sent me off to the dermatologist who confirmed that it was, in fact, Lividio, but when was the last time I had a skin check done? Now, when you have MS, that actually weakens your immune system, and if you have a genetic predisposition to something, it can come through, and unfortunately, melanoma runs on both sides of my family, and I had a three millimeter, so it was tiny, little mole on the lower part of my shin, and that was actually melanoma. So while they were looking for lymphoma, they found the melanoma, which actually saved my life. Um, then by the end of 2016, I was diagnosed with another blood condition called mixed cryoglobulinemia. Now, um, all big, scary words, and it was a big, scary condition. It was causing inflammation in my body to the point that it was choking off all my internal organs and I was dying. Then in January 2017, I was diagnosed with mixed uh, with chronic lymphocystic leukemia and small lymphocystic lymphoma. Now, all the way through there, the only thing that I could control was the food that I was putting in my mouth. Um, so to me, food is fuel. And if you're not giving your body the best fuel that it can possibly get, then you're doing a disservice to yourself and you'll feel sluggish and everything. But I think Alison's going to talk about that more um, shortly. So I underwent chemotherapy. I'm in control of the cancers at this present moment um, of time. Um, they did affect the MS. And then at the end of 2017, I had a major reflare, woke up one morning and couldn't put my feet on the ground and then spent the next three weeks in hospital trying to learn how to walk again. Uh, so that was very scary and, and having to use all the mobility aids um, as well. And fortunately here, we're lucky in Australia with NDIS and NDIS helped with support workers and mobility aids for me and, and everything like that. Um, I've never gone back and put all the weight back on um, through medications. When I went through chemo, I thought, Finally, I'm going to be thin in my life um, by having chemo, but I know nothing ever goes easy. Um, I actually had an allergic reaction to chemo and they put me on steroids for uh, 12 months and I ballooned out. Um, so sometimes you can't control what your body's doing on the outside, so to speak, but you can still give it good nutrition. So although I was blooming out, I was still giving it good nutrition. Um, I've had COVID twice uh, recently, about three weeks ago, and then last year. Now, by having all the chemo that I've had and all the medications that I've had um, has given me another condition called mast cell activation syndrome. And I am limited as to what I can actually eat, um, but I eat lots of healthy food. Now, I exercise regularly. I hated exercising when I was a kid. So Alison was talking about environmental factors. Um, that was one of them. I hated exercising as a teenager, even in my 20s, and it wasn't until I started losing weight that I actually started to walk. I used to joke that it was an occupational hazard for me to go for a walk because I'd fall over. I now know why I fall over when I go out for walking. So I've had MS for a lot longer than when I was actually diagnosed. Um, I took up uh, tug of war in 2001, which led me to going down the weightlifting um, path. And I've represented Australia internationally for Olympic weightlifting, which I took up after I was diagnosed with MS. Um, so I was weightlifting uh, prior to MS and represented Australia internationally in all round weightlifting. But I took up Olympic weightlifting after I competed in the disabled section at the Australian Masters Games um, in bench press, uh, walked in on the Monday morning and then took up the bar and, and took up weightlifting. I'm still competing uh, last year despite everything that goes on in my body. Um, I competed in the all abilities sections 
twice in um, strongman events, strong person events, if you want to be politically correct, and um, won two titles in that. So a healthy mind and a healthy body. I look after my um, mind by regularly seeing a counsellor and having a coach as well. So both of those uh, are really important. So that's just a small glimpse of my story. Um, you can and what an amazing story it is, Thanks. Justin, like absolutely incredible. You've been to hell and back and, um, you know, you're still thriving. So it's just amazing and I'm sure that it can give people some inspiration today. So let's just talk about our first tip, tip number one for improving your body and mind. Uh, let's just go into that. Sure. We're going to talk about stress. Now, stress plays a significant role in MS. Um, they don't like each other. They really don't like each other. Um when you're under stress, when your body is under stress, it will um, affect your cortisol levels. You'll go into a fight or flight mode. Um, it you've got to be careful on on what stress you're actually putting under your body. Sometimes we can't help the stress um, that we're under, but a lot of the time we can control it. So it's a matter of sitting down and working out um, what is. Uh, causing you stress. That's right. And what sort of things can that include? I mean, I imagine there's kind of a lot of things that we can, you know, that can trigger stress. Um, let's just have a quick chat about a couple of them. Uh, so people that you hang around, you know, you are the sum of the five people that you hang around. If you're hanging around negative people and it causes you stress to be around them, then change your tribe. You know, um, I know that through COVID um, and looking at social media that was coming in, there was a lot that wasn't aligned to my values and that would cause me stress and ag agitation and anxiety. Um, and I control that by just unfollowing that person and controlling what comes in um, into my life. I used to get very stressed in watching the news. Um, I made the decision three years ago to stop watching the news. If something important happens on the planet, it'll come up in conversation with someone and then I can go and do my own research. Um, I make sure that I get enough sleep um, because I find that if I'm not sleeping enough, then I'm putting that extra stress on my body, um, making sure that I don't overload myself with tasks and things to do and businesses um, as well is, is uh, something that plays a significant role. Yeah. So, you know, you you probably also do some breath work. I know that you get a regular massage as well, like just to reduce that stress down, um, and I know that you have already mentioned that you, you know, you go to counseling sometimes just to reduce that stress, talk things out. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to actually just help that stress level as well. And I actually have a little, a little cheat sheet, um, that, uh, for relaxation sort of ideas. So give me a why in the chat, if you would like the link to that, cause I can give you the, the link to this I little cheat sheet. I love one, Alison. Thanks. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, I will pop it into the chat. Here we go. Now, if um if you miss the the Google Drive here, we will be sending out all the links uh with the video this afternoon um as well. So yes, yes, yes. Uh so it's in the chat now, so you should be able to get the link to that. And what I'll also try to remind you of at the end is um, to actually save a copy of the chat, which will actually have all those links and all the discussion that we've had today. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you about that at the end so that you can just make sure you've saved it. So you've got all the, you've captured all the information and you don't miss anything. So we'll definitely recap on that at the end as well. So now we're going to talk about Alison's journey because it's not all about me. Um, your journey, Alison, is so inspiring um, with with the way that you've controlled your MS with your diet. Can you share with us your story about how all this came about? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I I was diagnosed in 2005. 2005. Uh, so it was in the second year of my PhD research. So I was doing research into forensic analytical chemistry of all things. Uh, so it was quite a stressful time in my life and I was in a bad relationship too, which was, um, if you've ever sort of had that kind of emotional stress that really triggers that kind of heart 
sort of centered um, feeling uh, that really um, was driving up my stress a lot. So I have had about 20 relapses despite being on harmful immunosuppressants for 15 years of my life. So I've done something like 6,000 injections um, of Gapaxone and beta on those kinds of things, um, but it didn't kind of keep me stable. So that was until 2018. So I had what I would consider to be a life-changing relapse. So my brain fog was so bad that I couldn't even work out what eight divided by two was. And at the time I was an analyst, so I needed my brain, as you can imagine, you need to be able to think. Um, and I couldn't even work out what eight divided by two was. I had no energy either. And, you know, I'd try to get up and do stuff. I'd try to talk myself into it, be like, no, Alison, just, just get up and, you know, do some artwork. You'd love the artwork. So get up and do some art. And I'd get up and I'd be like, oh my God, I just need to go sit back down again. I was exhausted just by moving like five meters. Um, So life didn't look very good. I remember one day I was just sitting on the couch, binge watching Netflix, staring out the window like a zombie. And this thought entered my mind and it was, Alison, if you don't figure out how to get better, this is as good as your life is ever going to be. And, you know, I'd been like trapped like a prisoner in my own body on this couch for months. And I was terrified of that. I thought this can't be it. Like I've got so much that I want to do with my life. So I knew that I had to figure out how to to get better. So I remember reading something about some people that had, you know, improved their health just through diet. So I reluctantly, very reluctantly, made some changes to my diet. And within three months, my energy came flooding back. I had, you know, uh, I could think clearly again. I didn't have anxiety and depression anymore. And I wondered what the heck had gone on because this didn't make sense to me that, all of a sudden my life could be improved so drastically when all of the medications didn't help me, but food did. Like I was really confused. So that's when I started researching because I needed to know what was going on. So let's talk about your research then, Alison, and talk us through what foods to eat and what to avoid. Sure. Um, Okie dokies. So Some of my research stemmed from a couple of these people um, that I've got on the screen here. So you may or may not have heard of them. Um, So we've got Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. She's a researcher and she's overcome about, I think it's about three autoimmune conditions. Um, As some of you would know, like once you get one autoimmune condition, it can kind of tend to lead to like uh, another and another diagnosis. Um, So she ended up changing her diet and now she's a pillar of health. Uh, So she's the paleo mom. You can actually look her up. Um, She's in the United States. Um, So the paleo mom, which is M-O-M for people in Australia, it's not spelt the same as ours, Um, but she's an amazing resource and she's got some incredible information out there. And then on the right-hand side, we've got Dr. Terry Walls. So she um, had MS so bad that she was in a tilt reclined wheelchair and she is a physician. Uh, she knew that her health was declining and declining. She just kept feeling worse and worse and worse. And so she, in a state of desperation, like I think I was too, um, she decided to do some research and change her diet. And a year later, you can see her uh, in the picture on the left, uh, on the right hand side. She's on her bike and she rides now to work every day um, as a pillar of health. So she's been able to overcome some pretty major obstacles, which is pretty inspiring. That was where my inspiration came from to make my changes as well. Um, So I did a lot of research, but I probably won't have time to go into it all today. But what I wanted to point out was some of the research I found was that autoimmune disease and chronic illness in general is always on the rise. And I didn't know why, because I, it didn't make sense to me because we're in the most medically advanced era in human history. Why aren't the numbers going down? Like we should be getting cures and, you know, preventing this kind of um, rise in disease. So it didn't make sense to me. And you can see the um, the figures um, in the background here. You know, we've got the number of autoimmune disease just continues to rise. And on the right-hand side, it actually shows the rise in um, MS prevalence as well over the years. So I was like, well, this doesn't make sense to me. So I started looking into uh, what might have been contributing factor. And so... I came across the idea of food. So as Justine mentioned before, food is our fuel, right? So this is where we get our energy from. And it's like a car. So we know that we need to put gas, 
put fuel into our car every day or not every day, but each, um, you know, when it runs down low, we need to top it up with fuel in order for it to function properly, right? Um, but what happens if we put diesel fuel into an unleaded car? Let me know in the chat what happens to the car. <laughs> Somebody's shaking their head going, uh -uh, it's not going to work. That's exactly right. It doesn't work properly unless we put in the right fuel, right? So we'd never intentionally go to the gas station and be like, do you know what? Just for fun today, I'm going to put in diesel fuel to my unleaded car and just see what happens because we know that that's not going to work, right? So if we think about our bodies, our bodies are similar. Like we need fuel the same as our car does in order to function properly. So our fuel is, you know, let's say that it's this apple on the screen here, but what happens if we put, you know, ice creams in as a, you know, so just a visual metaphor here. What happens if we put the wrong fuel into our bodies? What happens to our bodies? It's kind of the same. We've actually got the right fuel for our bodies to function properly versus the wrong fuel, right? And unfortunately that in today's society, the wrong fuel is everywhere, right? So we've got saturated by marketing, um, you know, our supermarket shelves are lined with all these bad foods that are actually causing this inflammation in our bodies. So we do have the right fuel and the wrong fuel. And what happens is it causes inflammation. Now, we don't have time today to go into um, the details about how this works, but it's all about gut health. And when we, we eat these wrong fuel, this wrong fuel, um, we cause inflammation in our bodies and then we get these warning signs. Now, have a look at the list let me know in the chat whether you've experienced one of these symptoms before. Fatigue, weight gain, digestive issues, reflux, heartburn. Let me know in the chat. Put a Y in the chat if you've experienced one of these before. Let me know in the chat if you've experienced all of these before because I know I certainly pick have. Me, pick me, pick me. I know. Pick me. I know, right? It's crazy because we get these so often that we just take them as granted. We just kind of go, you know what, every time I eat that food, well, yeah, I get a headache and I don't feel well for a couple of days, but that's just what happens. But it's actually our body giving us these warning signs. It's actually like a siren going off going, hello, I'm not actually happy because you're causing inflammation and I don't know what to do about it. So I'm going to give you these warning signs so that you can start paying attention, right? And, it and a lot of things is, Alison, people don't realise that it's actually the food that they've eaten that has caused these warning signs. So uh, who's just had a little bit of a light bulb moment then that it is the food that you're possibly eating that is giving you a headache or giving you joint pain or we all know like allergies, but it's all the other things that you don't realise that could be food related. I know. It's quite fascinating. And when I came across this information, I was like, oh my God, well, that makes so much sense because, you know, of all the symptoms that I used to get um, and it's so, so common. So unfortunately our food, slide's not right, um, our food has gone from this, you know, lush, fresh produce that is the right fuel for our bodies to function properly and it's gone on to this sort of pseudo food food, which is not really um, the, the food of our ancestors and the food that actually fuels our body. So this is the wrong fuel. And we're doing it all the time. Like most of the food that we eat is actually the wrong fuel for our bodies. And it starts to malfunction like our car would remember, you know, we know that our car wouldn't function properly on the wrong fuel. So we need to have a look at our diets to start fueling our bodies with the food that can actually heal us. Like it's honestly the right food can actually cause healing in our bodies, which is kind of amazing to me. We are what we eat, that old cliche. That's exactly right. So the number two tip that we've got to share with you today is to eat a healthy diet. A healthy anti-inflammatory diet is what has absolutely saved me. Um, and it's definitely, definitely by far my number one tip um, for living well with MS. Yeah, fantastic, um, Alison, for sharing all of that. If anyone's got any questions, please pop them in the box and we'll try and cover them. Um, otherwise, we can answer those um, later on. I forgot to mention, I actually have um, an Eat This, Not That diagram as well, which actually shows you the top five foods to avoid 
in order to reduce that inflammation. Let's have if a look at like, that. If you'd like a copy of it, let me know in the chat. Um, I don't have a copy that I can show you on the screen right now, but if you'd like a copy, just let me know in the chat. Give me a why in the chat if you would like a copy of my Eat This Not That diagram to help you start looking at the foods that you're eating and which ones you should be avoiding and which ones to eat. Oh, there's a few saying yes there. I'll put my hand up too. Yes, please. <laughs> I will pop the link in the chat here. Thanks, Alison. No worries. Um, sorry, the screen is being a bit weird. All right. Now, look, before we move on to the next tip, I just wanted to ask you, Justine, we have a little project coming up, right, um, which is a pretty exciting project that you've been taking the lead on. So tell us a little bit about um, the upcoming book that we've got coming up. So at uh, the beginning of uh, the year, it might have been towards the end of Christmas actually last year, um, I wrote an article uh, for Mamma Mia which mentioned uh, Selma Blair, Christina Applegate and myself all having MS. We're all linked by a common thread, but our journeys are also different. Just like those of us sitting here today, um, a lot of us have MS. We're all linked because of that on World MS Day, but our journeys are all so, so different. So that got me thinking um, about maybe putting a book together of MS stories from uh, around Australia. So it's an anthology of people's stories and experiences from fellow MS MSers. Um, its ability is incredible. Um, the different journeys that we've all been, it's absolutely incredible the different journeys that we've all been on. Uh, so there's uh, over 20 authors that are in it. We're set for uh, launch in September. Alison is one of the authors uh, in the book. MS Australia is writing the forward and one of the chapters in the book as well, and they're going to um, advertise it through their networks. But if you're interested in getting um, a copy, uh, here is a... Uh, pre-sale registration so no credit card or anything has to be supplied today you're just registering your interest if you would like to um, go on the mailing list that as soon as the copies are available for purchase uh, you'll get notified immediately on that we're bloody proud um, of this book um, it is a, a book that MS Australia actually, I've had talks with the MS nurses, the head of the MS nurses, and they're going to put it in their toolbox. So it'll be a book that uh, will be good for someone who's newly diagnosed, uh, for someone that um, is struggling to understand the disease, uh, for your family that want to have a better insight into what MS is as well. Some of the stories, well, actually every every story, I've read every chapter um, in this book and we've been in a writing group for the last six weeks um, compiling it all together. It, it's just mind-blowing. Um, there will be other books down the track um, for more uh, of people with MS in Australia, but we're looking at doing an international book as well. So if you know someone internationally or you're here today internationally and would love to partake in that, um, please uh, email me. Also, we're looking at doing a carer's book as well because um, I've been a carer, obviously, of someone who has MS as well as now having it myself. I think it's important to tell the carer's stories. Uh, as well so it's very excited um i can't wait to share it with the bigger wider world um in september but the google doc uh is there for you to register your interest um to keep up to date with what we're doing with it yeah it's such an amazing um amazing sort of project that you've put on um justin it's been an absolute privilege to be part of it because you know, our stories are so different. And, you know, if we can offer, as you mentioned, like for people that are newly diagnosed that are like, oh my God, I just don't know what to experience. I don't know how to get myself out of this. I don't know whether this is normal. Do you know what I mean? Like this is going to be a really great guide, as you said, for them. Um, plus, as you said, like there's nurses that are getting interested to be able to help their patients with MS um, just through this. And I know having been in the writers group and having um, submitted my chapter as well, 
it's amazing. Like the people in that group and their stories, like, oh my goodness, you've been in tears sometimes, right, Justine? <laughs> I have, I have, and um, Susie's just joined us today on Zoom as well, and and Susie works for me. She's my uh, left hand girl, and uh, she's been doing some of the editing as well, and she's been blown away from someone that doesn't have MS, but you know is involved with me all the time. Um, has said to me, "Oh, do you do you have that symptom? Do you have that symptom?" And I'd be like, "Yeah," or "No," or. Um, and just educating. So we're hoping that this book educates the wider community to make it a little bit easier for us MSs uh, to get through our daily struggles. So uh, moving right along. All right. So, look, let's move on to tip number three. Can you talk us through tip number three, Justine? Let me just share the screen again for you. Sure can, Alison. So tip number three is prioritising self-care. Now, self-care to me is huge. Um, I own and run seven businesses and people say to me all the time, oh, how do you do so much? I do so much because I look after the number one person in my life and that is myself. If you do not look after yourself, you are no good for anyone else. You know that old um, saying, has anyone heard the oxygen mask theory? Yeah, love it. It's perfect. You've been on a plane. Al, you've been on a plane? Uh-huh. Yeah. So just type in the chat box, people, if you've been on a plane. The reason why I'm saying that is the hostess will stand up and tell you to put your own oxygen mask on first before you help anyone else next to you. So that includes your children and everything. Put your own oxygen mask on first because if you are not looking after yourself, Um, with putting oxygen in, you are no good for anyone else. And it's the same in our daily lives. Where are you on the ladder of life? Are you right down the bottom looking up the top and struggling or are you up more towards the top? Now, when you look after your own self with self-care, It is very important that that's how you can manage your MS symptoms and support your mental health. So some of the things um, that can happen when you're not looking after your self-care is that your MS symptoms will be more active. And so going back to stress as well. Yeah, but it seems sort of... um... It seems kind of selfish, right? You know, we often think that prioritizing self-care, particularly if we've got a family, if like if we've got kids to look after, you know, family that are kind of relying on us to do everything and be everything to everyone, who has who's who's in that situation where they're like, oh my God, I've just got to look after everybody else and I'm the sort of hub of the family. If I don't do it, then the whole family falls apart. Honestly, it seems selfish to actually go, well, I'm going to look after myself first, right? Who it's feels that way sometimes? You know, type it into the selfish. chat. Give us a yes in the chat. It does feel selfish. But as you mentioned, Justine, it makes perfect sense. Look out after yourself. Everybody else benefits, which is amazing. Yeah, that's right. And look, some of the things that we can actually do for self-care um, is like you mentioned, I have a weekly massage um, and it's not a pre- pleasurable massage, I can assure you. Um, my legs feel like there's razor blades slicing through them uh, most of the time when people touch them. But I know that if I don't have my massage, then I can't walk properly then for the next week. So it helps me de-stress as well by having that massage. Have you ever had a head massage? Oh, my God. Um, it's insane how good it is, isn't it, right? <laughs> it is so insane. It's like I'm just going so you can just massage my head and I come out feeling so much nicer. Um, Counselling is a big one for me, Um, counselling and self-care. So I don't believe it's my family or friend's responsibility to hear me vent, and especially when I'm having bad days or bad weeks. Um, so I go and pay someone to offload uh, all of that and and free up that mental space as well. And um, I'm a big, big advocate for um, looking after your mental health. That is self-care and going and seeing a counsellor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, depending on what your needs are. And first port of talk, call is, you know, going to your doctor and, and having a chat about that. Um, do and it's okay. Bring- it's okay. Like I feel like sometimes we feel like that's weakness. 
No. And that we go, oh, no, you know, we don't want to see a counsellor because that's kind of weak and I'm strong enough to be able to deal with this. Like just know that looking after yourself, whether it, meant it be mental health, um, whatever wellness tips that you've got, it's okay. It's okay to actually be vulnerable and to maybe go and see a counsellor and to cry. Like that's okay. Um, you know, sometimes I remember when I first got diagnosed, I was like, well, I'm strong. And I didn't think I realised the gravity of you know, the situation at the time too, but it took me two weeks and then I bawled my eyes out. Like I was just in tears because it really hit me and I didn't, I didn't want to be weak. I felt like I didn't want to be weak, but what I've realized over the years is that it's okay. People understand. It's a sign of strength to go and ask for help. And I've just had a counseling session or I'm a coach. So I've just done a coaching session with a client and, um, one of the things that she's struggling with is to try and get everything done in her day. And I went, well, get a house cleaner. If you can afford to get a house cleaner, oh, but, you know, I'm failing. And I went, no, it comes under self-care. It's self-care. You know, if she's sitting up till 3 a.m. in the morning trying to get um, time in her life that she can concentrate on her hobby, uh, when I said, just get a house cleaner and that'll free up six hours of your, of your week. I said, the house cleaner will come in for two to three hours and do what it takes you six hours to do. Now, she doesn't have MS. She's an able-bodied person. But for us to try and do housework, I know when I used to try and do it, it would take me, you know, a whole day to vacuum the house and then I'd be fatigued out. How is that self-care? I mean, yeah, my house was, my my floors were clean, but I was so fatigued um, from doing it. So and know, another thing that I, I realised with that too, with house cleaning particularly, um, I used to have a mindset of like all or nothing. So if you can't afford a house cleaner, this all or nothing thinking is really, really bad, right? So what I realised is that you can actually do a little bit. It's called pacing, pacing yourself. And it's something that I learned when I was in hospital, um, getting treatment for pain management, actually. And what they teach you is that you're allowed to just do a little bit. Like what if, I know we've got the mentality of if we're going to vacuum the house, we just do the whole thing, right? What's the point of just doing one room? But what if you just did one room and then had a rest and then waited till you feel, feel okay and then do the second room? And then maybe just have a rest. Like what will happen? Like what catastrophic thing could possibly happen if you just don't do the whole housework or if you leave it for an extra day or if it takes you a week to actually do it step by step? Like what's going to happen? It's okay, right, Justine? Like it's okay to be able to do that. It's not about being like perfect either. Like we have this mentality that everything has to be perfect. Every house has to be done a certain way. And like we really, when you have MS, we don't give up. We just modify, you know, we don't give up. We just have to modify. And again, that comes under, you know, self-care as well. And you, you've got to find things that you enjoy doing and that make you happy and that you're at peace with and um, hobbies. Do you have a hobby? Are you partaking in your hobby? I've just taken up learning the drums, which might surprise you all. I've got a little. I know. Did you get your drum set set up? Yep. 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 Yeah, I needed to find a hobby that I didn't make money from. So um, I'm learning the drums. But, you know, you never know. I might end up as an international rock star yet. So That's right. I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me, to be honest. I just think that your neighbours are going to have something to say about it. No, no, they can't hear me. I put my headphones on and they can't hear it. It's electronic. It's great. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's so, so cool. I love it. But that all comes under self-care. Um, you know, that's something that makes me happy. I can take some time out of my day and, and do something that makes me happy. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, all right? You may not have a lot of money and go, well, I can't go to massages, I can't do and that, I can't do this, I can't do that. Find something in your home and prioritise yourself in doing it. That's right. And I think some of the simple things that I've done is, um, you know, just drawing, you know, or some artwork because I do enjoy that. I find that really relaxing and soothing. Another thing that I've done in the past is like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, I just kind of immerse myself in the jigsaw puzzle. It's using my brain. So I'm kind of keeping my brain active by doing it, but it's just a little thing. Like it's nothing, nothing major. It's not groundbreaking or anything, but it kind of just makes me happy. And it's just a time that I can just de-stress and not have to worry about things. 
Um, you know, I think one of the things I noticed when I went around to Justine's house uh, the other day is that she has lots of plants. She has lots of plants that just sort of kind of, I don't know, it's got a really happy feel when we go into your house um, because of that. And it's, it's nice. It's just all those little things. And maybe cooking might be one of your things. Just take it nice and slow um, so that you're not sort of overdoing it and burning yourself out. But, you know, all these little things can just add up to just a happier you, which is exactly what we want. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And looking after our self-care there. So if you've got some things that you do for your self-care, pop them in the chat. We'd love to know um, what you do for your own self-care and you might inspire us uh, to take up a new hobby or um, something different in our lives. So Alison, your experiences highlight the impact of our next tip. Can you share with us what that is? Sure. Um, let me just share the screen again here. So uh, this is my MS relapse graph. So I, as I mentioned, I'm, I was an analyst. So I like kind of, you know, analytics. I like graphs. I like visual things as well. So I find that to be easier to um to get on board with. Now, what it shows here uh, is on the left-hand side, <laughs> sorry, I'm just working out my left and right. Um, it shows the number of relapses. Uh, that's the y-axis. Now, across the bottom is the years, right? So it's the number of relapses I've had per year. Now, you won't necessarily be able to see all the detail, but the shaded area at the back so there's a bit of orange and then there's blue in the middle and then the yellow. Those are the drugs that I was on. Those are the disease modifying therapies I was on. So my MS diagnosis is down the bottom here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but it is down the bottom, down the bottom here. Um, and at that time in my life, as I mentioned before, I was in on kind of a lot of stress. Uh, and so I got a number of relapses per year where I would have to go into hospital and have um, uh, steroid treatment, which is, you know, obviously the usual course of action. Uh, so I was in that stressful relationship as well during the second year of my PhD. So a lot of stress going on. And so I had started on beta -feron, uh, beta interferon, which is a disease modifying therapy. And because that wasn't holding me very stable, they switched me over to Copaxone at that time. And then things started to kind of settle down a little bit. So for the next sort of few years, I had an average of, you know, one relapse per year uh, on average. And then in 2013, uh, it was just after I got married, um, I had gone over to Bali and that was for my honeymoon. And I had taken my Capaxone injections with me because obviously that's what you need to do. Now, Capaxone, has anybody on Capaxone or has had it before? Um, if you if you are, you'll know that you have to actually keep them refrigerated. So I had to order a little bar fridge um, on my trip and that was kept in my room. So I kept my, my uh, injections in there. And on the second day, I think, of the honeymoon, I opened them up to have my injection. Lo and behold, they're frozen. They had all frozen. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because I'm on holidays. I'm overseas. How am I going to get new injections, right? So I contacted my neurologist and I said to him, should I still use these? After I thaw them out, should I still use them or should I just go for the next two weeks without my medication? And he sort of said, look, they're probably fine. Just, um, you know, just thaw them out and then you can use them. But I do remember reading that you probably shouldn't have done that. Anyway, I did that. I thawed them out and I used them again. And anyway, a few weeks after I got back from my honeymoon, I got a relapse. Now my legs stopped working. So all of a sudden I, I had to use a walking stick. Um, to get around. So I had the usual methylprednisolone treatment that did nothing. Um, I had, you know, other bits and pieces, they did nothing. And they're like, look, the only way that we might be able to get some wins on the board for you and maybe get your leg function back is to try this experimental treatment called plasmapheresis. Now, if you've not heard of that before, it's actually a plasma exchange 
process and they it's like an oil change for your blood. So they basically pump out your blood, they spin it down in a centrifuge, they take off the plasma portion and then they get rid of that. Then they pump new plasma back into your body. So you're basically just getting new plasma pumped into your body um, because that's supposed to be where the active um, uh, antibodies are. So um, that's that was the idea. Get rid of those bad guys and then that will settle down your relapse. Anyway, so I had that treatment and a few months later, I still couldn't walk, um, but I was like, you know what, my brain's not impacted, so I'd really like to go back to work. So I went back into work in my corporate job and while I was in the office, there was a lady there and she said to me, have you ever tried changing your diet to help with your MS? And I went, mm, no, because I've got an autoimmune condition and that seems kind of crazy. Like I've tried all this medication. So what on earth is diet going to do for me? And she said, well, I've got an autoimmune condition too. So she had celiac disease um, amongst other things. And she said, a paleo diet really helps me. I'll bring in the cookbook and you can try it. So I was like, yeah, 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 sure, sure. You know, not thinking anything of it. Anyway, she bought in the cookbook and I felt compelled to have to give it a try. So I did. So I went home to my husband and I was kind of angry. I was kind of angry about the idea of having to make these changes that I didn't want to make that I like the sacrificing the foods that I enjoyed eating. I didn't want to do it, but I was like, I better do it just to, so I can rule it out anyway. So we made changes and I somehow stabilized. I didn't have a relapse for four years. And then I had felt fallen back into my old habits and lo and behold, I get a relapse in 2018. That was my life-changing relapse that I mentioned at the start. So since then, I've been educated. I know why food is actually impacting me and now I'm stable. But for those four years, I didn't realize. I had no idea what this food was actually doing to my body and why it was actually keeping me stable. I didn't create this graph until years later. And then I went, oh, my God. I didn't have a relapse for four years. I didn't realize, but it was because I wasn't educated. I didn't teach myself and learn those critical reasons why food was so important to my health. So this is the lesson out of this one that I want you guys to know, which is tip number four, which is keep learning, educate yourself, make sure that you know these things, because when we start learning, we actually can keep growing and keep evolving and keeping um, on top of the best sort of situation for ourselves so that we give ourselves the best chance of living the best life that we can. Um, so that's sort of my long-winded story about, um, you know, how that's really helped me over the years. What about you, Justine? Like, have you, have you found that education has been sort of a bit of a key for you as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. So when I was diagnosed with EMS in, it's funny how we all remember our diagnosis day. Who remembers their diagnosis day? Pop in the chat if you did. So mine was the 14th of March at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, that was the day my life changed. And t uh, four weeks later, I was told that I would never be able to work again. Now, I'd also had an employment disability employment service come in and tell me that there wasn't enough money or time on the planet to retrain me to work in anything else. And I plummeted down um, uh, very, very fast into that big black hole. Um, he did suggest that I find a hobby um, and it took me about four months to walk through the door um, of an art studio. I'd always wanted to learn how to paint and um, I would sit outside with crippling anxiety not being able to go in. So it was very scary um, at the time, not knowing what my brain was doing. I was full of emotions and I had that symptom that, you know, when you'd, you can instantly just start laughing and you've got no idea why you're laughing or you can instantly start crying and you've got no idea why you're crying. And I was very worried that that was going to happen out in the public eye and I'd start laughing at someone uh, for no reason whatsoever, except for my brain wanted to do it. Um, so anyway, I finally got angry enough at myself one day about four months later and I walked through that art studio door and I started to learn um, how to paint. Now, I don't learn like I used to. Um, 
I've had to change and adapt the way that I learn, but it doesn't mean that, that I can't learn. It just means that it takes me a, bit, a little bit longer to, to remember things, to process things, and I'm now more, okay, show me how to do this rather than read how to do it because it doesn't compute through properly. And that's okay. It's okay that it's a different way for me to learn, but it means that I can still keep learning. And I have. I've been like a sponge in the art world and and taken it all on board, watching lots of YouTube tutorials. We live in such a modern age that on the tip of our fingers, we can access any information that we want to. Um, So it's been really critical in the last 11, 12 years um, on advancing my skills, my skill set. I am now a publisher. Um, and who would have thought that 12 years ago? Um, I now publish uh, other people's books as well as my own books. I'm now an illustrator uh, for other children's books. I've written and illustrated my own children's book. Who would have thought that when I was diagnosed? And Yay, I, I see it, Jenny. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, reading books, listening to podcasts. We have a really good um, one that we're going to share with you in a, a little while, aren't we, Alison, on that one? Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's really important to keep your brain active um, and keep using your brain. Now, uh, 12 years ago, I could not count at all. One of my major symptoms was, which I didn't mention at the start, was I lost the ability to count, tell the time, use money. Now I'm 12 years down the track um, and I'm still not perfect at it. Um, some of it's come back, but the brain has actually rewired a lot of those pathways for me. So now I can add up to a certain amount. I can look at a clock and it takes me longer to work it out than what it ever used to, but I can look at an old fashioned clock and work out what the time is. Um, So, you know, don't give up on your brain, keep working at it. Um, Keep exercising your brain is what I'm trying to say and um, learn new things and, Uh, that will keep it active. Absolutely. And it just gives us the best chance of, of getting, you know, once we've got all the information, like they say knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And I a hundred percent believe that because I was in the dark before about any thought sort of empowerment. So when I got diagnosed, um, you know, and like probably a lot of other people, you get told, um, look, you'll be on medication for the rest of your life. It's a lifelong condition Um, I got told I'd probably be in a wheelchair in 20 years time, um, if not sooner and good luck. Mm. Like, it's kind of like, that's what we get told that there's no hope. There's no, there's no chance of actually having any control. It's really disempowering. Um, but what I know now is that there are things that we can do just like what Justine's touched on. And we've talked about today, you can take little bits of control back. You can actually take little bits of control back. So learning is the key to actually doing that um, and being able to, yeah, stay kind of as stable as possible. So, look, let's move on to our tip number five, Justine. Um, Let's talk about what that is. Let me just share the screen. That's that big scary word. (laughs) Creating healthy routines. Yeah. Yeah. I was never a routine person. Never used to be routines, never made my bed, just went with the flow of things throughout the day and it got really chaotic. That all changed when I got MS. Um, Routines give you stability and predictability. It provides stability, reducing stress and reducing anxiety um, in your body. Um, One major thing that I do every single day without fail is make my bed. Why do I make my bed every day? Because I've achieved something. And if the rest of the day goes to shit, at least I've done one thing. And there's nothing nicer than hopping into a nicely made bed at the end of the night. Um, Sleep regulation. So, you know, improve your quality of sleep. For every hour that you go to sleep before midnight is actually worth two hours after midnight. So if you're a bit of a late night owl, then try and be in bed by 10, 10.30, and that will actually give you two hours extra sleep, not the one hour extra sleep. Um, If you struggle with insomnia, 
um, then talk to your medical professions about it. But it may have something to do with the food or the beverages that you've drunk before bedtime that's actually keeping you up. Um, so sleep regulation, getting up at the same time every day is also important and not lazing around um, in the bed. Um, habit formation. So, you know, create healthy habit development for better health. Um, are you going for a candy bar when you should be going for a glass of water? Have you got a headache and you go for Panadol instead of going for a glass of water first? Um, who stands at the fridge and opens up the fridge and goes, oh, I don't know what I feel like, then go to the pantry and go, oh, I don't know what I feel like? Um, chances are it's just a glass of water that you need. Um, are you developing habits where who goes to the movies and always has to order the popcorn and the choc top and the big thing of Coke? That's just a... Yeah, that's a habit associated with an activity that you're doing. You can actually go to the movies and just drink water uh, through there. Uh, mental health, and I've spoken about mental health as well, um, you know, creating a, a routine around your mental health. So um, going and seeing a regular counsellor, keep a journal of all your thoughts, write it all down. Um by looking after your mental health, that will boost confidence and enhance psychological well-being. Resilience. Now, I'm known as the queen of resilience. Um, so resilience isn't um, about how fast you bounce back from something, but it means that you are bouncing back. And by having all these things put in place, so healthy routines and looking after the fuel in your body as well as the fuel that's going into your mind. And there's a whole heap more of um, 10 top tips I've actually developed um, will help um, gain resilience. It helps you navigate through, you know, those unexpected challenges. And we all have challenges and that's what life is. You know, none of us get through a whole lifetime without having some adversities thrown in in front of us. Some of us have more than others. And, you know, creating balance is the sixth one there. So, you know, help um, balance work, your social activities and self-care. Do you keep a regular planner? Do you have a planner that you write down your appointments to yourself? So your exercise to the gym, um, catch up with friends, because that's another self-care activity. You know, I went out on Saturday night for dinner and dancing with my friends. Um, so that's always high on the list of priority. Um, and, you know, are you overworking as well? So create that balance and that harmony throughout your life. Absolutely. And when it comes to forming habits, um, it takes an average of 66 days. Uh, would you believe it to form a habit? That's uh it was some work done by, let me see if I can remember correctly, um, the Journal of Psychology, of Social Psychology. I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, and it was, they did a study and it was um, between 254 and, you know, a little bit less than 66 days. That was kind of the range, but it was an average of 66 days to form a new habit, which if you think about it, it's a long time, right? It's a long time to do it and to do something consistently daily um, or even multiple times a day sometimes to actually get that so that it becomes, I think it was Warren Buffett that said something along the lines of um, the chains of habit are so heavy you can barely break them until they become so light you can barely feel them, right? So because because you start doing this, it's hard work to begin with. And then all of a sudden it just becomes really easy and then it just happens, right, without you even trying. So um, sticking to a routine is, um, yeah, super, super important. Yeah, most definitely. I, I just had a flashback to um, when I was morbidly obese, I would eat 14 takeaway meals a week. Wow. And had, and had every excuse under the sun as to why I couldn't cook. I was just lazy. That's what it came down to. Whereas now I would be lucky to have a takeaway meal. Um, it makes a huge difference and that's a habit that um, that definitely changed and yeah. changed my quality of life. Absolutely. And I, I, I admit I was addicted to junk food and sugar for 30 years. Like no joke. Um, if it tasted good, I would eat it. Like that was my life. I was just like, well, I didn't put on a lot of weight because weight is what we consider to be the unhealthy thing. If we put on weight, well, we should, should cut back on the sugar and the junk food, right? But anything else we're like, eh, doesn't matter. 
Um, so I didn't have much of a weight problem. So I just kept eating and drinking all the wrong stuff, um, which is really, really bad, but it can be broken. It's just about doing those healthy daily habits and knowing what to do, which is kind of the half of the battle. Um, look, so we've learned a lot today, right? So we've actually covered off our, uh, five tips, but I thought what might be really useful is actually to do a bit of a self-evaluation before we finish up. Oops. Let me just stop sharing that because I think that's going to be dangerous here. So <laughs> let me just get myself in order. We'll go back here and then I'll start sharing my screen again and then we'll be fine. So while Alison's doing that, who's learned something new today? If you have, put a why in the box and, and tell us what's something new that you've learned um, from us. Over to you, Elle. All right, now I've got it up. Okay, so self-evaluation here. I just thought grab out a pen and paper and just give yourself a little rating for these areas. So when the first question is how energized do you usually feel? Between one and five, is it one where you're like, oh, my God, I've got no energy ever? Or is it a five where you're like, wake up and you're full of beans and you're full of energy? comes to brain function, how clear is your brain function? Are you full of brain fog? Like is it a one where you're just like, I can't get my brain switched on? Or is it a five where you're like really clear in the brain? Um, your level of relaxation, are you a one where you're like really stressed all the time? Or are you a five where you're like the Zen master and you're really, really chill? Um, how healthy would you rate your diet? You know, are you eating lots of those inflammatory foods that are causing those problems? Or are you eating really healthy all the time or maybe somewhere in the middle? How would you rate your resilience? And obviously Justine's explained the what resilience is. It's how can you bounce back from adversity? Are you really good at it where you're like, yeah, it doesn't impact me? Or is it a one? Is it, you know, you find it really difficult? How happy are you with your body, your weight? Is it a one where you're like, oh, I just hate looking in the mirror? Or is it a five where you're like, I feel really comfortable in my own skin? And how do you want to feel? Is it a one? You're like, oh, I'm happy just feeling like crap all the time. Or is it a five? You want to feel amazing. Or is it somewhere in the middle? Give yourself a little rating out of those because it's really useful just to do a bit of a check-in with yourself. Um, and look, if it's one of those things where you feel like there's a bit of a gap between how you want to feel and how you do feel, there's some room for improvement. And the only way that we can actually get that to uh, to shift is to take action. Isn't that right, Justine? That's right. That's definitely. And what I might do also is I'm just going to pop those um, details into the chat so you've got those questions just in case you didn't have time to write them all down. Uh, just so that you've got those there as well. Right. You know, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. So, you know, I know that it's extremely daunting to look at, you know, you might be overwhelmed at the moment or how do I change everything? You don't have to. You just do one thing at a time. And when you've mastered that, then you work on to the next thing and then you work on to the next thing. The first thing you might want to change is how much water you're drinking. If you're not properly hydrated, then you're not going to have any energy or anything uh, to do um, well in your life. And it's just about taking, it's about taking a step because that's the most important thing, but just a small one. There's no point in just trying to do everything all at once because guess what? 95% of people fail when they try to do it themselves and they've got no idea what they're doing. They'll just sort of go for it. You know, who's trying to do change their diet before and stuck to it for a couple of days and then failed. I think we all have done that. I know I've done it like a million times over. I never could stick to a diet um, when I just had no idea what I was doing uh, until sort of this time around where it actually finally stuck. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard to do by yourself. So just little bits, little steps, little steps at a time. Yeah, most definitely. Great tips for that one, Alison. So can you just summarise, Justine, what we've talked about today, our top five tips? I sure can. So tip number one is reduce stress in your life. Tip number two is eat healthy and anti-inflammatory diet. Tip number three is prioritise self-care in your life. 
Tip number four is stay educated and keep learning. And tip number five is create a healthy routine. So fellow MSs and everyone else that's in here uh, today, that brings us to the end of our workshop today. But because you've stayed with us, we want to give you um, some exclusive offers for free. So I'm just going to find the link why Ali um, has a bit of a chat. I'm going to give you um, a free uh, resilience discovery call. Excellent. And that's totally worthwhile. Justine will actually coach you through some of those things and actually talk through your individual situation to give you the best tools that you can, uh, that she can to actually get you out of, um, out of that, which is absolutely amazing. Um, let me just, so there in the chat box is the, um, booking link, uh, to go in there and I will give you three tailored strategies, uh, to face your own adversities. Um, in there. There we go. And there's the QR code as well if you'd like to book in a free call with Justine. Um, so you can just get your phone out and snapshot that on the screen. Otherwise, you can use the chat to get that link, um, which is very, very cool. We'll just leave that up for a couple more seconds in case anyone wants to take a photo. And there we go. What I would like to offer you guys is a free health breakthrough session with me. Um, so what we do is we actually start looking at seven key life areas that are related to you and how you're tracking in those. So you get clarity and focus about the next steps to take about, you know, the things that are hijacking your health and zapping your energy and what to actually do about those. So I actually create your own custom health blueprint. Um, and we go through the strategies of like, right, what can I do next to actually fix this up? Um, and Justine's actually done one of these with me as well. So she's got her tips too. Um, so these are normally valued at $197. So if you go onto my website, um, everheal.com.au, you'll actually see that they are $197, but I'm actually giving you guys the access for free. So there's the QR code that you can actually um, do that. And whilst I have you there, I'll see if I can find the link and pop that into the chat for you as well. And so while Alison's doing that, I'm also offering you a free ebook um, that you will um, be able to download off my website. So I'm just putting the website address up on there for you and um, you just go in, pop your details in there and you'll be able to get the reinvention ebook um, completely free today. Awesome. That's amazing. And you're going to get a lot out of this information. Uh, so look, you've got all the information into the chart. So if you're wanting to save all those links, now, as Justin mentioned, you'll get them in an email, but if you're wanting to save the chat, so you've actually got this, a copy of this, if you open up your chat box, so you've got all the, the links on the side, um, right down the very bottom, there's three dots. We've right. got one more link to share, Alison. All right. Oh, well, anyway, I will explain this now and then we'll do it again afterwards. If you click on those three dots, there's a little option that says save chat at the very top. If you click on that, it will actually save a copy of it to your um, chosen location. Uh, so you'll be able to access that afterwards as well. Right. So do you have any final sort of thoughts or words that you wanted to talk about? Maybe something to do with a little podcast, maybe? Yeah, so Alison and I um, had a bit of a brainstorm uh, a couple of weeks ago and I'm the type of person that if I think of something new, I action it straight away. That's a, a new philosophy um, of mine and I follow the Mel Robbins five-second rule. So we came up with doing a podcast together, sharing our knowledge, our wisdom, our journey, our highs, our, our lows, um, which uh, is called MS Unmasked, and it's available on all uh, major uh, podcast streaming platforms. Um, I think Alison's going to pop the link um, up there for us. Uh, for you. Um, it's brand new. We've got one episode out. We'll be filming the second episode uh, potentially today and it will go up um, over the weekend. We're asking for questions as well. So if there's a topic or a question that 
you want to know about, um, then you can email us at any time or follow us on our social media and just pop a question to us and we'll talk about that in the upcoming uh, podcast uh, episodes. So um, we're really excited about that one and sharing our knowledge and helping as many people as we can throughout the world um, on how they can manage their MS. And just information that, you know, we might be talking about something like, you know, the first episode that we talked about was mainly about our diagnosis, right? And people might be listening to it and just be like, oh my God, that was totally me. And sometimes it's just about hearing from somebody else to go, yes, I can relate to that. I don't feel alone in this, um, which is so, so important because it's a lonely journey otherwise, isn't it? Yeah, most definitely. And when I was diagnosed um, back in 2011, there was not there was not one um, Facebook support group uh, available for me to chat to someone else. My partner at the time was doing the whole ostrich in the sand thing that, you know, if we didn't talk about it, it didn't exist. Well, that didn't help me in my body because I was dealing with it every second of the day. So I started uh, supporting each other with MS in Australia. That Facebook group is is my little um, project there. So uh, if you are feeling a little bit alone in that, feel free to reach out into that group and we'll add you in there and um, there's lots of support in the community. Yeah, and I've got my Facebook group as well, which is uh, facebook.com slash groups slash autoimmune diet, um, where you can get some tips and tricks on how to actually manage um, you know, your diet as part of that sort of anti-inflammatory side of things to boost that MS as well, uh, to, to get you better outcomes for your MS as well. And we'll put all these links into the email that you'll all receive um, later on today uh, just in case you haven't been able to save the chat and um, you'd still like to access all the information. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, I want to encourage everyone to take action and support each other on um, this MS journey. And uh, you're all wonderful. You're all kicking goals. And just by being here today um, shows that you are interested in taking control um, of your own life. That's right. And look, we're happy to stick around for the next few minutes and just answer questions. If anybody's got questions, um, feel free to type them into the chat Uh, We hope this has been helpful for you guys and we've been so honoured to be able to share our World MS Day with you all and hopefully give you some tips that can help you on your journey. So if you've got a question, please feel free to add it into the chat. Um, Facebook links into the email. Yes, we will make sure that those are in there too. Um, it's going to take me probably too long to type it out because I'll have to remember one. And I've got 10 of them, so (laughs) I'll put a couple of them in the uh, email to you um, as well. So, you know, never lose sight of what your dreams are and never listen to someone else's false belief. You know, my doctor said to me, 12, 13 years ago, oh, you'll never be able to work again. Yet here I am, a highly successful, award-winning artist, author, speaker, publisher, coach, consultant, mentor, manager, affiliate, and that's all happened since I was diagnosed with MS. All right, you are still able to be valuable members of uh, society, contributing into society. You just have to learn how to adapt and modify um for it so you know um if i was stuck um with the mentality of oh that's all i've ever been able to do that's all i'll ever be able to do um then i wouldn't have progressed and that's even for you know able-bodied people so think outside the box outside the square um and you can reinvent yourself and and create a better life for you Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on, Justine. And obviously you're a testament to being able to live a life that's, you know, that's amazing um, even after an MS diagnosis. And, you know, I know from my journey hitting rock bottom and then being able to bounce back um, has just been such a privilege to be able to do that. And and now to be able to share that information with other people to help them is is so um, such a privilege. So my last words to you would be to aim high, follow your dreams, and never give up on yourself. 
Um, and if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, once again, if you'd like to save the chat, right at the very bottom of the chat box, um, there are three dots that say more. Click on that and click on save chat and that will save a copy of the chat with all those links. But as Justine's mentioned, we will also be sending you out a follow-up email with all of the links that you can get in touch with us, um, get all your freebies as well. Um, so that will be in there as well. So it's been a pleasure, everyone. And until next year on World MS Day, stay as healthy as you can. Yep. Thanks, guys. As I say, if you've got any questions, leave them in the chat or, or stick around. Um, but, yeah, it was a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Loretta. Uh, we will definitely put those into the email. Thanks, Michelle. Chanel, thank you so much. Bye, everyone.